Welcome back. So in the last video we've seen how the uh, joint representation that one can always assign to uh, a Lie group and its Lie algebra allows us to introduce a, a nice metric on the Lie algebra um, which is the Cartan killing metric. In particular this metric allows you to easily um, define the notion of compactness of a uh, Lie algebra by saying that one can choose a basis such that this Cartan killing metric has um, say only minus ones on the diagonal um, and it also gives a, a preferred notion of what basis to choose exactly by requiring that this metric is of this, um, this simple form. Um, now in this uh, second part what I want to do is to show you that this uh, Cartan killing metric actually uh, defines uh, another concept which is really quite useful when it comes to uh, irreducible representations of a leak group and this is the Casimir operator. Um, it's, a, it's an operator which will easily allow you to determine in what representation you're actually living when somebody hands it to you. So here's the definition. Um, if G is compact and XA is um, XA are the generators of an irreducible representation D, then the so-called quadratic Casimir operator so a mathematician would typically call this the, the quadratic Casimir invariant because there are also other Casimir invariants but the physicist would really call this the Casimir operator is the following uh, matrix C that is given by the contraction of the Cartan killing uh, metric with your basis of generators, where this gamma AB with the indices upstairs um, is just the inverse metric. So this is gamma inverse. A, B. So we're here we're using the same convention as you would use in GR where the metric with the indices upstairs is the inverse of the metric with indices downstairs. Is the inverse Cartan killing metric. Okay. So this is a um, uh, n by n uh, matrix if you're in say a um, n dimensional irreducible representation then this is the n by n matrix C that satisfies a very simple property that we're going to derive now but the first thing we uh, we should check is whether this definition really makes sense. Um, in the sense that we do not want this uh, this special matrix C to actually depend on our choice of basis of generators X A. So what I claim is that C is independent of the choice of generators XA. <coughs> and from your general relativity uh, kind of perspective, this already um, seems uh, to go in the correct direction because we have indices which are summed over. And typically, when you have all, all indices are contracted, then you expect this to be invariant under uh, transformations. So let's just check that this is uh, the case here. So really what we should check is that if 
we go from a basis xa to a basis xa prime given by a linear transformation of your basis vectors uh, sorry, xb that this particular combination is actually invariant. Um, and we already derived last time that under this transformation the Carton killing metric really transforms as a metric so gamma prime AB is equal to LAC LBD gamma CD um, so an index or a matrix multiplication uh, notation this is really uh, L gamma uh, transposed evaluated at index uh, AB so this means that the inverse metric gamma AB prime has to be the inverse of this matrix so that's really the matrix uh, L transposed inverse gamma inverse L uh, inverse at index AB and this we're going to contract with um, X prime uh, A and X prime B so this means that if we look at the transformed version of this Casimir C prime so this is gamma prime a b x a prime x b prime what we really see is okay, let's write this in, in matrix uh, notation this is really um, let's, okay so this is uh, x uh, let's be precise if we want to matrix here so lambda or L transpose inverse gamma inverse L inverse times L of X times X A sorry not okay let me not write it like this so here we just have a B and then L B C X C and here we have X uh, D if you like uh, A D but what we see here is really just gamma inverse at D C so this is really the same as the untransformed uh, Casimir. So this is the exact same computation as you would do uh, to show that the, um, the, the the norm of a vector in say special relativity is invariant under a Lorentz transformation L. Okay. Now this is nice, this means that in order to, to say something about this uh, Casimir C, we can choose a convenient basis. In particular, in a convenient basis, we're going to show that this Casimir operator satisfies the um, following nice feature that it commutes with all the generators XA. So every matrix that occurs in the Lie algebra G. So let's see why this is the case. So since C really does not depend on the basis, let's choose the basis in which the Cartan killing metric is exactly of this diagonal form. So may assume we have chosen a basis such that this gamma 
AB minus delta AB. With the minus there because we're looking at the compact Lie algebra. So we have minus ones on the diagonal. So this means in particular that the inverse metric is also given by delta AB. Um, so let's just check explicitly that this is satisfied here. So then if you look at the commutator of C, okay, let's write explicitly what C is. Commutator C is going to be simply uh, XB, XB with XA. Uh, okay. Let, let's be a bit more precise. So I want to compute the commutator of C with XA. So this is um, minus delta A B C X B X C by definition commutator with X A. So this is minus X B X B just summing over for B X A. And let's now work out this commutator. So if you do this what you get when you take a commutator of a product of two uh, matrices is that you first get the first matrix in front of the commutator XB with XA and then you get the second matrix behind the commutator so XB minus uh, sorry, commutator XA XB Okay. But these are just the structure constants. Um, so we get minus XB F B A C X C minus F B A C X C X B. Okay, so these terms are very similar to each other. The only difference is that the order of the generators x here is different. But we can of course relabel the indices b and c or interchange those labels. So the only difference that we then get is that the structure constant appears here with b and c interchanged. But we just said in the previous video that F is going to be anti-symmetric, completely anti-symmetric in its indices in this particular basis. So this is zero by the anti-symmetry of FABC. Right, so we have a, a matrix that commutes with all the, the generators of the Lie algebra. But as soon as something commutes with all generators of the Lie algebra, then it's also going to commute with every group element. Because note that then if I want to compute a commutator of C with every group element, we know that every group element can be written as an exponential of a linear combination of the generators. So just working out uh, the, the, the series for the exponential, seeing that it all commutes with C, this is going to vanish too. So we have a matrix that commutes with all the matrices in the Lie group. Um, and now if we realize that we were starting with a representation D that was irreducible, we have a linear, tra linear transformation C that commutes with the full representation. This should uh, ring a bell from the, uh, I guess the, the, the second lecture of this course, which is Schur's lemma. So 
Here we go. Schur's Lemma. And this was uh, number two in our terminology, which was saying that if D was an irreducible representation and some operator C intertwines D with itself, which was just saying that if I take commutator with each of the group elements DG being zero, then C had to be a multiple of the identity the identity matrix. So really what we conclude is that this particular matrix that we can always construct is a multiple of the identity matrix where this real number that sits in front is a positive real number positive real number that depends only on the irreducible representation that we're actually living in. Okay. Um, so that's actually quite nice. So if I if I give you just a, a set of matrices um, that uh, solve the, the commutation relations with the structure constants of a, uh, a Lie algebra, but I'm not telling you what this, uh, what representation this actually is. What you can just do is compute the the Cartan-Killing metric, and then the Casimir operator associated to that. Um, evaluate it on an arbitrary vector in your vector space, and see that it's just going to multiply it by some real number. And this real number is going to be universal. It's just going to tell you what the irreducible representation in is that you're actually living in. Um, so one can actually say this more generally. So more generally, if D is possibly reducible, Um, and decomposes into irreducible, say as a D1 plus D2, etc., to DK. Um, then uh, this, the Casimir operator that you determine here will have uh, eigenvalues. Uh, C, D, uh, 1, up, up to uh, C, D, K. So let me denote here this, uh, this constant C as depending on the representation D. So, so d it is exactly these, um, these constants uh, that you would get if you would just look at these uh, irreducible representations individually. Um, and the uh, the error uh, so the irreducible component d say uh, uh, d a acts on the eigenspace um, uh, with eigenvalue uh, c d a so I hope you can read that. So if you have an arbitrary uh, representation, you would compute the um, the, um, uh, the Casimir operator. You would find all its eigenvalues, and you would see that okay, it will have some multiplicities, of course. Um, but if you restrict to the eigenspace of your uh, matrix with a particular eigenvalue, then you know that within this eigenspace, there is going to be an irreducible representation that whose you know, Casimir value corresponds exactly to that eigenvalue that transforms just within this eigenspace. So you can de determine explicitly from just a spectrum of this Casimir operator what this decomposition is going to be.
well, provided that you actually know a bit about what the, the Casimir values are of the irreducible representations. Okay, so this is a, a bit abstract, but um, when we look at a simple example, then you'll actually recognize that uh, to a certain extent you already knew this. And this example is SU2, so we looked at last week. So let me just mention that. So example of SU2. Um, so here, remember that we had the structure constants were of this form, so given by this completely anti-symmetric tensor for A, B, C. Taking three values, being a three-dimensional uh, Lie algebra. Um, so we can easily compute now what the Cartan uh, killing metric is going to be in terms of the structure constants. Uh, so we get that gamma AB, so explicitly uh, was given by this contraction of the, the structure constant. Let's follow, let me do it correctly. ACD, otherwise I get some minus signs wrong. B D, C, right? <coughs> but what is the result of this? Um, when you just uh, determine what the, the possible values are, this is just minus 2 delta A, B. Okay? So that means that the inverse metric gamma A, B is going to be minus 1 half delta a b so a Casimir element c is minus one half x one squared plus x two squared plus x three squared or slightly more familiar in terms so these were the the anti hermitian the skew hermitian generators if we look at the hermitian generators j of a which we're given by multiplying the skew hermitian ones by the imaginary unit then here we just get one half j1 squared plus j2 squared plus j3 squared So this really looks like the, the total angular momentum operator in quantum mechanics. Total angular momentum operator. And so the claim, or the thing that we proved here, is that the total angular momentum operator is commuting with all the generators, so with the the, the angular momentum operators in the x, y, and z direction. Now from quantum mechanics you know that this is certainly the case. Um, but here, I mean, these are just group theoretic uh, methods that tell us this. Now, uh, on Tuesday what we'll do is determine what the corresponding uh, Casimir value is. So on Tuesday, we're going to check that particular value here is, uh, let's check for minus signs, so C of j corresponds to the identity where C of j is one half j, j plus one. Which is also something that should be familiar um, to you from quantum mechanics in the spin j representation. Or in this more general statement, if I'm in an arbitrary representation of SU2, I compute the Casimir, it will have eigenvalues that are all of this form, and the different eigen spaces 
will actually transform as bin J representations. Okay? So that's all for this week. Um, the adjoint representation is going to uh, appear again and again uh, in the next couple of weeks because there is actually even more structure that one can uh, extract from uh, your joint representation that will allow us to uh, fully classify the, the compact simple uh, Lie algebras in, in the final lecture. And also understanding better the adjoint representation will allow us to, um, to, to find or classify irreducible representations of Lie groups that are more complicated than SU2. In particular for SU3 we'll go through this exercise.